Thank you. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and your conversation. It is now my pleasure to introduce our executive luncheon speaker. Dr. John Pfeiffer is a man of many talents. He holds a lot of degrees. A master's degree in speech communication and theater, an MBA in operations management and organizational behavior, and a PhD in communication disorders and learning disabilities. He has served in numerous educational roles, such as teacher, consultant, school principal, and assistant superintendent. He earned the Jane Langenbach Award for Learning Strategies Trainer of the Year for his work as a workshop trainer for special education, individual learning differences, assessment, and standardized testing. Dr. John Pfeiffer has served as a long-standing donor and volunteer for an Appalachian Summer Festival. For the past seven years, he has worked closely with festival staff to develop its highly acclaimed film programming, the Helene and Stephen Whitechops Global Film Series, curated by Dr. Pfeiffer, is one of the festival's most successful programs. Dr. Pfeiffer's pre-film lectures have been instrumental in building an audience for international <coughs> film programming in July. Dr. Pfeiffer and his partner, Mr. Ralph Glasser, Jr., were inducted into an Appalachian Summer Festival's Founders Society, a group of patrons whose support and service to the festival has been significant and transformative. We are very pleased to have such a talented and engaged guest speaker for our lunch today. I know that we will all enjoy hearing his thoughts on teaching and learning because those of us in the room who aren't educators have been educated and have children that are being educated and I don't think a day goes by that we don't read about education in the national news of late. So thank you, thank you, thank you, John, for being here today with us. Schaefer, the 56th Harlan B. E. Boyles Distinguished CEO. I have to tell you that I thought it was a moment of temporary insanity when Bonnie Schaefer asked me to address a group of business students, distinguished business faculty and staff, and very successful business alumni. And it was even crazier when I agreed to do it. It was only after I had said yes that it dawned on me that I had absolutely no idea what I would talk about to a group of current and future business leaders that might be of interest to them. And I struggled with that for weeks until Bonnie said to me, John, just talk about education. I thought about that for a minute, and I thought, that has never really worked well for me at a cocktail party. <laughs> Have you ever been to a cocktail party full of interesting, successful people 
who are highly paid, and someone comes up to you and says, so, what do you do? I'm always tempted to lie. <laughs> My name is Ron Howard. <laughs> I was Opie on the Andy Griffith Show. <laughs> and now I'm a very famous Hollywood director. But instead, truth wins out and I say, I'm in education. You can almost see the blood drain from their faces. <laughs> their eyes glaze over. They take a big, healthy swig of their drink, and they look for an opportunity to escape. So at the risk, oh, rest assured you're never invited back. So at the risk of never being invited back again, and possibly sending you all into a didactically induced coma, I am going to talk about education, because Education is about learning, and learning is critical to any endeavor, whether it be education, business, politics, sports, or the arts. So, let's begin. I want you to picture this. A child sits on a kitchen floor, and she is thumping a wooden spoon against a metal saucepan. She has learned that a certain action will produce a certain sound. And should she repeat that action often enough, she may also produce a reaction from her mother. And she may also learn that mothers are not always delighted by the same sounds that delight small children. But in its most basic and elementary form, that's what learning is all about. In fact, if you look in the dictionary and you look for a definition of learning, it will say something like this. Learning is the acquisition of knowledge and skills through experience, self-study, or instruction. So what I'm going to do today is to talk to you a little bit about three simple axioms of learning. Now, if there are any professors of education in this audience, I want to apologize in advance. And the reason for that is that you may find some of the things that I say oversimplified or perhaps inconsistent. And if I had the time, I would easily be able to explain those things away. But unfortunately, if I had the time, I'd have to charge you all for three credit hours. <laughs> so the first point that I want to make about learning is that learning is a process of change, not just addition. If you were pressed, most people would probably respond that learning is a process of aggregation. When we're born, we have a certain amount of instinctual knowledge. And through experience, that knowledge gets bigger and bigger. It's like a ball of play. And as you learn things, you add to it piece by piece by piece until the ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And voila, you know everything that you need to know. The problem with the ball of clay theory of learning is that it doesn't recognize what happens when a person makes a mistake. If you prescribe to the ball of clay theory of learning, what you think is that when you make a mistake, whether it's a mistake on a test or a whopper of a business mistake, that it's because you don't have the right kind of play, that you're missing something. And so what had, tends to happen is that people go out and try to find more play or the answer or solution to the mistake. <coughs> According to a man named Artemis Ward, who was a major general in the American Revolutionary War, he studied at Harvard and later taught there, and he was an effective member of Congress back when there were statesmen and Congress worked. Um, 
He said <coughs> that it ain't the things, and this is the direct quote, it ain't the things that we know, that, that we don't know, that get us into trouble. It's the things that we do know that just ain't so. So what I want to make a point of is that when a mistake is made, the learner doesn't always need to have more clay. The things that we think we know that just ain't so are the things that wreak havoc on learning. If something that the learner thinks he knows simply isn't true, then no matter what new information is brought to bear, it will not solve the problem. And sometimes it's the things that we think we know that prevent us from learning anything else new. And that's the tricky part, because we as learners don't want to mess with our balls of play. So what we try to do is just look for a new solution rather than change our minds. And when you start thinking of learning as a process of change rather than a process of addition, it makes it easier to understand why it's so hard to teach an old dog new tricks. It makes it easier to understand why businesses are sometimes doomed to repeat the same mistake over and over and over again. And it makes it easier to understand why politicians can't hear the arguments of the others on the other side of the aisle because they're not listen, willing to listen and reflect on what they know and change things when they need to know it. It also makes it easier to understand why my grandniece Debbie continues to say, between you and I. <laughs> this summer, I was having a conversation with my niece, and she had just gotten a new smartphone. And she was so excited to show me every feature. And I'm a technological dinosaur, so I just sat there and watched. And when she was done, she sort of leaned in conspiratorially and said, between you and I, the only reason that my father bought my sister and I these smartphones is so that he could track us every minute of the day. <laughs> and then she showed me her smartphone and claimed it was equipped with a GPS chip. And then she showed me the app that her father uses to trace her whereabouts. I was fascinated with the technology, but because I'm a former English teacher, I just could not let between you and I go. And I wanted to correct her and hope for the best. But I thought, well, here's an interesting anecdotal experiment that I can do here. So I said to her, why do you say between you and I instead of between you and me? And why do you say, for my sister and I, instead of, for my sister and me? And so I thought, here I am exploring what she knows. And she says to me, because it sounds better. <laughs> and I said to her, between you and I sounds better to you? I said, who do you know who speaks like that? Well, she got on that damn smartphone. <laughs> and she starts squirreling through there, you know, and she's looking, and you know how the, the millennials do now. It's always... And so she pulls up on the screen a tweet by a twit. <laughs> Kim Kardashian. says, look, between you and I, blah, 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 blah. So for the next 20 minutes, I had to instruct her on prepositional phrases, objects of prepositions, and that objects of prepositions always require an object pronoun. 
between you and me. I think I wasted my time. <laughs> but the bottom line is that we as learners have to constantly reflect on what we know. And what we have to do is always examine why we know what we know, and we have to be willing to change it. And that leads me to my second axiom of learning. Learning is a complicated and lifelong process. And so, because of that, you have to be not afraid to make mistakes. One of my personal heroes is a man named Ken Robinson. And some of you young people may know him from his TED Talks. He's one of the few people that actually has been asked to do three TED Talks, which is an amazing thing. Dr. Robinson is an educational leader in school reform, in creativity, in innovation, and he works in human resources in both education and business. And he tells this story, which is one of my favorite stories, about a little girl who's sitting in an art class. The little girl is six years old, and she's sitting in the back of the classroom drawing. And the teacher had already said that this little girl rarely if ever paid attention. And so the teacher was mesmerized and fascinated that this little girl was working so diligently. So she went back to the little girl and she said, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing a picture And the teacher looked down at her and said, Honey, you do realize that nobody really knows what God looks like. And the little girl said to her, They will in a minute. <laughs> what I love about that story is there is absolutely no fear in that child. She is not afraid of making a mistake. But in business and education, we stigmatize mistakes. And in fact, we work so hard to minimize mistakes that we sometimes destroy our learning environments. We introduce Common Core so that everyone is taught the same thing, regardless of where they live, who they are, what their interests are, and whether they are even willing to learn it. We measure learning through standardized tests in ways that have nothing to do with creativity or innovation, which are two characteristics that almost every business leader will tell you that they look for in children. We crowd out the arts and physical education because they are not part of the standardized testing program required by No Child Left Behind. Can you imagine if Mozart was in today's public schools? Amadeus, buddy, stop fiddling with that damn violin. You are never going to pass the North Carolina algebra end of course test if you don't stop playing the violin. We also hold teachers accountable for their students' learning, which I think is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Because those of us in learning know that learning is actively constructed in the mind of the person. It's not something that you can just pour into someone. So by holding teachers accountable for somebody, uh, someone else's learning is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And it doesn't matter whether you're a teacher or a business leader. It's important that you recognize that what is most important are the individuals that are working for you or learning from you. And that it is the key that you could provide rich environments for them to thrive so that they in fact can learn. And we have to reduce all of our misguided, well-intentioned things in 
constantly providing standardized tests. The last thing that I want to talk about is my third axiom. And when it comes to learning, the only thing that's more contagious than enthusiasm is apathy. While I believe that you can't pour knowledge into a kid's head, or you can't pour knowledge into an employee's head, I do believe that teachers and business leaders are responsible for creating rich learning environments that foster and produce the kinds of thinking that they want. When I used to do in-service training for teachers, people used to ask me what makes a good teacher. And I always <coughs> equated the following thing to being not only a good teacher, but being a good parent or being a good business leader. I believe that a good teacher is someone who is one part expert, one part cheerleader, one part benevolent coach, and one part noxious dictator. <laughs> My definition of an expert is not someone who has the most degrees. My definition of an expert is someone who can take the most complicated concept in their field and reduce it to its simplest terms. My mother used to always say, you only know your subject area when you can explain it to a five-year-old or your grandmother. And sometimes people who consider themselves experts, when they're having trouble communicating their ideas, whether they be students or employees, blame it on the learner. And that's the wrong thing for people to do. It's important for you to reevaluate and determine that you're able to explain the most complicated concept to your grandmother. Now, we all know what good cheerleaders look like. But being a cheerleader is more than just raising your voice, waving your arms, and crying out some memorized chants. <clears throat> Effective cheerleaders know that the most important thing is to share a vision with the fans. And once you understand and share the same vision, then people are more likely to listen and follow and learn. Now a benevolent coach shows rather than tells. They have the philosophy that they never ask someone to do something that they haven't already done themselves or are willing to do. This morning I was taken with Bonnie's speech and Roland Schaefer, who I did know, was an incredible business leader. And rather than bring Bonnie in at a high level, which sometimes business leaders do. He made her start in the trenches. And he didn't do it to punish her. He did it to ensure that when she did become the leader, she knew exactly what every other person under her knew how to do and was able to explain it. And finally, this is the part I like the least, you have to be a noxious dictator. Sometimes you have to be willing to just bring the hammer down. I will tell you this though, that it's important, uh, and in the words of Mark Twain, that you don't see everything as a nail. Because noxious dictators, uh, the research says clearly that the most productive learning happens when you are a coach and an expert rather than a noxious dictator. Um, what's important also is that all of these four parts come in equal parts. If any one of them dominates the personality of a good teacher or a good le le leader, the learning fails. And I'm sure that all of you have known this because I've worked for a couple of noxious dictators who had no other redeeming parts. Uh, if you are an expert who cannot communicate and cannot share 
what you know in a simple way, you end up having people that don't learn and it's impossible for you to delegate to them. If you have a cheerleader who praises everything, then what usually happens is nothing has any meaning or value. Uh, I used to work with a woman who climbed the ranks in education really quickly. And she says everything is wonderful, whether it's wonderful or not. She came to my house to visit, and we cooked a simple dinner for her. And I must have heard six times how wonderful the dinner was. And it was beginning to lose credibility. So finally I said to her, Jerry, I get the point. The dinner was wonderful. Please don't say it again. <laughs> and that's what happens to cheerleaders who praise everything all the time. They lose their credibility and they stop being believable. The problem with benevolent coaches when there is too much of the coaching is that everyone spends all of their time in meetings and hearing about their experiences. And finally, the noxious dictator who takes charge and doesn't pay attention to any of the other parts, ends up destroying morale, initiative, and takes away all innovation. In conclusion, I just want to say, I believe that the primary reason that people don't really think about learning is because they're too busy trying to gather as much clay as they possibly can. It's important that you take the time to reflect and think about what it is that you know. And that's especially true when mistakes happen. I believe that everyone should spend time reflecting on what they know. And I believe that rich learning or business environments honor individual differences, respect interests of all kinds, and promote creativity. And finally, I believe that the best leaders in education and or business are enthusiastic learners themselves. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your attention. <laughs>
sincere thanks to all of you for attending and making this such a special day. Bonnie, Jamie, thanks for bringing us such a heartfelt and really inspiring comments. And, and John as well. I think, you know, the two of you said you were nervous, but you're two of our most engaging and humorous speakers yet. So thank you so much for making a difference in the lives of our students and creating those transformational educational experiences for them. Thank you.